I'm Andrea. I am sitting in my office living room situation with my teal couch and some pillows and a bunch of other decor behind me, including Goji's food and and, um, and some other fun accessories. I am wearing a yellow shirt with eyelet sleeves, a gold choker with pearls, and then black glasses, my cat eye glasses. Um, what's my hair today? It is kind of shoulder length, blonde, um, and red lips, as we said. So how about you? I'm Kia, and I am sitting in my room in my office chair. Behind me is a cream colored wall and a gray, um, why am I blanking on the name of a curtain? It's a gray curtain, and I'm wearing a blue shirt, silver earrings, red lipstick, black and white glasses, black on the top, white on the bottom, and my black hair is pulled back into a bun. Awesome. Thank you. So Mm -hmm. I know Kia is, I'm so excited to be in conversation today. Um, You are a journalist, author, screenwriter. You are the establisher of hashtag disabled and cute. Mm -hmm. Um, You have an amazing book out called The Pretty One that came out a few years ago that we love. (laughs) <laughs> what I know is that you are a proud, disabled Black woman. Yeah. Um, and I've been thrilled to get to know you first through your work and then now more personally over, I think, the past year. So it's always exciting when we can be for one another, you know, yeah. as disabled black women, um, Black women, you know, that we can be, you know, really uplifting of one another. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you chose to share space with me today. So we are talking about this book, Tarana Burke and Brene Brown's You Are Your Best Thing, Vulnerability, Shame, Resilience, and the Black Experience, of which you are a contributor. And, you know, as you know, when I reached out, this is the first of of a fun little book club that I'm starting called Books and Baddies. <laughs> I love the title. And so when we were, you know, kind of contemplating the first book and I saw this title, I know it resonated so much with me just without even knowing. And then I looked at the back of all of the contributors and I'm like, oh my gosh, what a gift. What yeah. it, this is this is really um, exciting. Just knowing, thinking about the past year and everything that we've been through, thinking about um, yeah, just where we aim to go and our experiences and the conversations that we've had. So I would love just for you to share kind of what was you know how, we kind of want to know the tea. Like how does it work <laughs> in, in a, a situation like this where you're invited to be? Um, a part of essentially an anthology with two really incredible, obviously, figures um, in their own right. And so, yeah, what was that process? What did that look like? It was wild. So Brene and I had been following each other for a couple of years at that point. But I did something last year called uh, Share the Mic Now with uh, Tarana and a whole bunch of other really cool people where 100 Black women um, took over the accounts of 100 prominent white women. And we were doing that together. And I think we were in a Zoom um, getting ready for it. And Toronto was like, hey, Ki, I have a question. What's your email? So I gave her my email. And she was like, listen, me and Brene Brown are putting together this top secret project. And I would love to have your voice be a part of it. And literally, I think she sent the email and I answered her before the minute was over. I was like, absolutely. Like, literally, I will do whatever you need. You want me to write whatever, I'll do it. And essentially, it was just, she asked me to do it. And I said, absolutely. I literally would would never say no. Um, and basically, what I did was I sat down and I thought about the ways in which I wanted to talk about being vulnerable, being a Black woman. And, and again, making sure that I mentioned you know, the intersection of queerness and disability and how the way that we navigate the world as Black disabled women is not the same way 
that a white disabled man or a white disabled woman navigate the world. And we need to talk about that. And I think that a lot of times when you see narratives about blackness, disability is often left off the table. So for me, it was really important to make sure that I was very much talking about disability from beginning to end because it is such a part of our lives. And I think that for me to be a part of this anthology with all these really cool black people talking about their own shame and their own vulnerabilities, to be that person that's like, hey, yes, let's also think about disability in this conversation was just truly a dream come true. And I was really excited that I had the sort of um, permission to say what I wanted to say and not have to, you know, water it down in fear of hurting someone's feelings. I was just able to talk about what I wanted to talk about and also be championed and supported in the way that I think we don't often get in general as Black women. Yes. That's, I mean, that's so true. I just, what I love about what you just shared is it, and and that was a question that I actually had for you and you answered it because, you know, we all understand the concept of tokenism. We get it a lot, especially because of the fact that we represent multiply, you know, marginalized communities, whether it's we're the Black person in a disability space, whether we're the queer person and, you know, all of that right and so we know that and so to hear that you were essentially invited into this conversation having already been in relationship with these people is to me like it's it's almost a relief you know what I mean yeah (laughs) yeah we're so used to often being like can you come you know as an afterthought or can you be our poster child or you know whatever it might be but to know that you were already involved and so this was just an evolution of things that were already happening which really speaks to the fact that they value your perspective and experiences so that i know that that makes me thrilled i love that i'm so glad to hear yeah i mean you know firsthand that there's a feeling you get when you're the token. And it's like, oh, hey guys, it's June. Um, It's Disability Awareness Month, it's the ADA. Can you come do something? And then it's cricket for the rest of the year. But to know that I had the ability to talk about what I want to talk about in a random month and still be in conversation with these people talking about these things that impact us, but we aren't often seen. It just really felt nice because I felt like for one of the first times I wasn't forced to talk about disability, but I was given the room to talk about it. If you haven't seen, right? Yeah, I just it was. I'm so grateful to them for that. That's so good. They did not reach out and say, "Hey, Kia, can you come talk about disability?" They're like, "Can you come be yourself and talk about whatever you want? You and who you are is, you know, something that we." we need to know more and hear more and learn from. Um, and that's every aspect of you. That's huge. I love that so much. <laughs> it that really is, is. That's so good. Well, that, that segues well into kind of the, the next piece in terms of your essay. There were so many things for me that you say, but I was like, oh my gosh, she's, she's speaking my story, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and one of those, so, so thinking, so we're talking about you being able to be yourself. And we know that that is an evolutionary process. Like that is not something that you, you just were born, you know, in that space. And you talk about the fact that you've not always been proud of your disability. And I know I resonate with the idea of not wanting to be, you know, the center of attention because it essentially draws attention to, you know, what we, essentially have grew up hearing was wrong or you know incorrect or whatever it may be broken mm-hmm. um and yet you also talk about which i i resonate with the idea of always you say you but i've always loved being black so like the proud the black pride which i know my parents would went to hbcus and so similarly always had that Mm-hmm. that, you know, um, but not being proud of the disability. So can you talk a little bit about, and that's kind of where you enter um, your essay. So a little bit about, about that, would love to hear. Yeah, so I think for me, 
um, growing up around Black people, around my family, and just seeing them and having this thing that connected us and made me feel beautiful because I knew they were, it was easy to love myself for being Black. I was seeing myself on TV as a Black person. You know, I talk about Brandy's uh, Cinderella and how monumental that was for me just to see her fall in love and have somebody choose her as a Black woman. You know, we grew up with shows like That's a Raven and Living Single and having all those shows that made us see Blackness in different light. And we would lose that later, but I think to have that outright, it made it so much easier not to question the fact that this thing that I relate to um, with my family and these people that I think are beautiful inside and out, I can also be that because I am also Black. So it was really just me being like, this is what I'm seeing. And it's looking real good over here, Blackness. Well, right. as a Black woman, it's looking real good over here. But when disability came into the fray, it was like, I didn't grow up around a bunch of people with disability. Whenever I heard about disability, it was either in those like weird telethons that were like, uh, give us money because we're helping disabled people. Or those weird 2 a.m. commercials where they're like, sprinkling holy water on wheelchair yes. users and they're just standing up and they're like i can walk again praise the lord like it was just a completely different um experience because whenever i heard about disability it was always negative something was always wrong the person never survived anything it was always like i hate myself and either help us and like we can't speak for ourselves so i was immediately like oh i want none of that yes we're not even gonna i don't want to talk about it i just yes. want to i don't even want to hear the word disability or whenever anybody would bring it up I'm like nope nope we're not we're not gonna talk about it it's not a thing it's not happening because I think again it's the messaging of it all like I felt beautiful and seen and understood as a black woman because of what I was seeing um out in the world and also on my tv screen versus disability it was like easy to hate because everybody else was hating it you know yeah. everybody else was like oh no that's not right. Like, that's not what you should be like as a person. So it was really easy for me to internalize that and be like, oh, so this is the thing that I have to hate because everybody else does. Yeah, that's that's the experience. That's yeah. exactly what it is, you know, so true. And so that kind of recognizing that the, the book is, you know, talking about vulnerability and shame, resilience. Um, you know, one of the things you say, the most in interesting thing about shame is that it, it hangs around like, you know, basically bad habits, thriving on its familiarity, allowed to remain because we are either too tired or too jaded to think we can survive um, without it. And when you got to this part, Lord, I was like, you said it stole my ability to dream. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Um, and that concept of, um, you know, survival mode, what does that, what does that mean? It's literally just trying to get through the day um, without outwardly crying, without feeling any sort of emotion that people could internalize and be like, what's wrong with you? Or just trying to live in a world that is not designed for me and knowing that People are going to look, they're going to stare at me because I walk with a limp. They're going to ask me what accident I've been in, pray over me and say they want me to be healed, tell me that I'm being punished and I need to figure out how I should fix what I did so that God will heal me. Um, it's literally just trying to make it day to day without doing any sort of thing about, without any sort of dreaming about what my future could look like, who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, just trying to get through the day was really how I was living for the longest time of just being like, get up, go to school, be miserable, come home, go to sleep, wake up again, the cycle repeats and repeats. I had stopped dreaming about acting or writing or falling in love or walking in a custom gown on the red carpet. I had stopped all of it. I was like, it's never going to happen. It was really just me having a fully fledged defeatist attitude. Mm. What do you, and you, you talk about multiple instances, um, and, and I'm thinking about where, where you say something to the effect of like when you realize or discover that disability was a bad thing. Do you feel like that was that 
moment where you moved into that mode or were, were there other things that kind of compounded to get you to that? You know, I mean, I think, I think, well, I was such a, a very like happy kid. So I think it wasn't until that moment when I realized I was like 12, I think and some kid was making fun of me in the cafeteria. And I realized like, Oh, there's something wrong with me. Like this, this disability thing is wrong with me. That makes, that means that I'm, not worthy of anything I don't deserve to be happy I mean it was literally like the biggest spiral because first of all middle school is already tough and then somebody makes fun of you and you internalize that and I think that the reason that it stuck with me is because I had never seen anything that was the opposite I mean my family totally treated me like I was everybody else and that was great but I think for me at that time seeing a peer it had no relation to me whatsoever, no sort of obligation to love me like I thought. I was like, oh, well, then this must be the truth. And my family must be mistaken. And this sort of pain is what I'm supposed to feel because I'm being punished. You know, I, I don't know what I did, but like I would wish, I would wake up and wish that I was in a different body and just, you know, pleading because I thought that something was wrong. And I think that. That's when it started. When I was like 12, that's when it really took root and only grew from there. I, you know what's so interesting is I have a very similar story at like literally the exact same age. I was in middle school. And I remember sitting at the lunch table with my friends who I ate with every day, all white. Because <laughs> that's, you know, same. School, same. you know, and um, they, it, it must have been like a Monday morning. And they were talking about uh, such and such. I won't say the girl's name, but I do remember. I'm not great at names, but you always remember the people who hurt you. I feel oh, like. same. Um, and she was talking about the slumber party that happened over the weekend with, you know, the other three girls at the table. And so I'm like, well, why didn't I? And I'm not typically a bold, you know, person, but it just I'm like, we're all friends here. So why was it? Why wasn't I invited, you know, to this? You all had a summer party? Why didn't you tell me? Oh, well, it was in the basement. You're in a wheelchair. We didn't think you could come. And so I was just like, well, you didn't even ask. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. you didn't give me an opportunity to, because first of all, my dad would have carried me down the step. You know what I mean? Like they would have right. made it. But it, it, it sticks out to me because it was the first time that I realized that people were going to make judgments about me um, and make decisions for me uh, without my consent or without, you know, it, it's the whole concept of ensuring what we talk about in our work, right? Like ensuring that disabled people are at the tables, at, at the decision making yeah. table that inclusion ensures that like it's at the beginning, not as an afterthought. Like you just totally made an assumption that I couldn't be there without asking me. And it really, it, 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 you know, it's those moments that we have that either tend to um, kind of increase our uh, self-worth or essentially devalue us in a way, you know, um, and really impact us. And so then we get to do the work of what you talk about, you know, later, which is is that of, um, you know, you talk about how shame kind of took different spaces and places in your life, how it essentially switched tactics. Um, and you went from, you know, feeling bad about one thing to then, you know, other things, not being great with numbers. I remember you said, you know, just all of that. So can you Talk a little bit more about kind of that concept of, you know, shame and what that that looks like essentially. Yeah. Or switching, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so funny because after Disabled and Cute went viral and I was telling my story about how I learned to love myself. People were like, oh, so you're good. You know, you have, like oh. you're set. Everything's good to go. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, I have to work at this every single day. And not only that, but like I said, Shane is this weird, familiar ex-partner who like, you know, is bad for you, but you have good moments. So you're like, yeah, I can, you can hang around. It's cool. I'll just, you know, adjust. And for me, it was like the minute that I learned that my disability didn't inherently make me terrible. 
my brain was like, yeah, well, um, you should be skinny. And if you're not skinny, then you're still terrible. Like it was just a, a two second switch of my brain to be like, oh, well, I'm not, we're not done here. Like yes. you're not, you know, be, be skinnier. You should be prettier. You should have longer hair. You should um, be taller. You should, all these things that just, either aren't ever going to happen or just are impossible. My brain was like, well, now that we're not focusing on disability, watch how quickly I can make you, you know, spiral out about other things. Because I think there's a familiarity in shame, you know, mm. when, when we're so easily hurt by someone or something is what my therapist calls a core belief or the core belief that I'm inherently unlovable mm. doesn't necessarily mean the disability aspect to prosper because it can go to like people would love you more if you were skinny or people would love you more if you were tall or people would love you more if x y and z thing because shame is so easy to access it's much easier to access than joy than it is happiness and confidence is and so that's why I tell people this is everyday work but I work so hard to love myself like myself and be confident the reason that I'm always willing and able to say something when I see something or just say, this is who I am, this is what you're going to get, this is what I'm going to give you, is because I know the other side of that, of tucking myself away, of not saying anything when I'm angry or hurt or upset, of just taking it and how exhausting that is. And so I tell people all the time, like, shame, <laughs> shame is smart. Shame is the sort of thing that will, it's like a chameleon. It will truly, truly, truly change at a moment's notice in order to fit the narrative of your core belief that you are somehow lesser than. And to me, it's like, I am, I mean, everyday work of like, yeah, here's some things I like about you. Here's some things you can work on, but also don't let yourself fall into that pit of just, not being good enough because of X, Y, and Z things. But there's always going to be something that your brain is going to tell you. If you, you, if you, you know, had more money, if you did X, Y, and Z, you would be as happy as X, Y, and Z person. But the thing is, is nobody's as happy as they should. We've all got stuff we're working on. And, mm -hmm. and I think the thing for me is just reminding myself and other people that shame isn't a thing to be embarrassed of. It's a thing to tackle. It's a thing to try and work with to change you know shame is not something that you need to feel guilty about because everybody has shame yeah it just looks different for different people that's so mm -hmm. yep May, all of the gems that you just <laughs> ah your core belief i mean that's it that's that's it oh and and so then you talked about kind of what the the process looks like for you in a day-to-day um, what does it look like to, because another thing you talk about is forgiving yourself for shame that you once had. So what does that mean? I mean, I do a lot of talking out loud to myself That's just a... because I think otherwise, you know, at first I was trying to say things in my head, but it also felt like a secret that way. And so now what I try to do is outwardly say like, hey, younger Kia, I'm really sorry for um trying to push you away when my book came out my the pretty one and I didn't want to talk about my shame and I didn't want to talk about the fact that I ever felt bad about myself I'm, I'm like hey younger Kia today I today I'm sorry for the fact that I um lied about how you felt or hey hey younger Kia today I'm sorry about the fact that I um didn't defend you when you needed it you know I try to treat my shame like it's my younger self and like oh, wow I, yeah and like I need to um apologize so that we can both move on because otherwise it's going to sit in me and I don't want that <laughs> sure. mm, people didn't know they were coming for a straight therapy session on today <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow that's so good um mm, I, and I, I mean one of the things I know even just that, like you said, the the talking out loud, I struggle with that, you know, a lot. It is, it's like putting it out there. And it's like, we know the power of our words or, or we may not, but I know I can say for myself. And yet it just, it feels 
you feel like you're protecting yourself in some way by like yep. not putting it out there, but you're really essentially doing the opposite. So that's so good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and honestly, if it's because it is weird. So what I try to do is like, I'll wait until nighttime when I'm in my room by myself and I like, you know, whisper as- aff- affirmations to mm-hmm. my younger self, like, hey girl, we got through today. You would have no idea like, how many cool things that you did today? Like, I hope you're proud of me. Like, I do all of it. I'm like, I hope you're proud of me. Look, like, look what we're doing. Like, girl, we wrote a whole book. Like, all of these things were just wow. me, my younger self. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, it's fine. <laughs> this is wow. I love this. This is <laughs> I needed this. If no one else did, so thank you. So I want to switch a little bit and talk because you talk about and I know we know this, uh, you know, as as black women, but you talk about the relationships you had, your your bond with your mom, mother and your grandmother and and in relation to resilience um, being due to the care and, and the love that you received from them. And so it just I know speaks to kind of the power of relationships that fuel us both as receivers and as as givers so in turn how you you know serve as a mentor whether indirectly or directly to other you know queer women disabled women black women all of that so can you talk a little bit about how you know just the power of 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 relationships when it comes to that oh yeah totally i mean i would not be here with you today if it wasn't for my mom and my grandma i mean fully two of the strongest women that I have ever known and just really two people who made and make me feel like I like anything is possible. I think what happens with disabled people, as you know, is that sometimes even when their parents mean well, they have such low hopes and dreams for their disabled children. They have such um, an ability to be like, oh no, you don't want to do that. That's too hard. Don't don't do that. You you can't do that. You know, whereas like my mom and my grandma literally never said the words to me. You can't do that. Don't do that. Don't try. Every time that my sister got a scooter or a bike or some rollerblades, I also got them. Yeah. My mom was fully like, oh, no, we're not. We're not doing any of that. Anything that you want to do, you can do. I fully believe in you. Don't worry about that. You never have to worry about the fact that I want to make sure that you succeed. And that game changing because I see so many disabled people not have that support system and not have those people like I'm rooting for you. You can do this. We're just trying to work around. Whereas like I had that coming from every corner family wise. Mm-hmm. People just being like, okay, you got this. You'll figure it out. Like of course you're gonna fall and it's gonna hurt and you're gonna scrape yourself, but you're still gonna get back up. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think that um for me it's like whenever I'm talking to a young disabled person, a young disabled person, or a queer person, or a black person, I say like, what Roxanne said to me is fully like, I believe in you, and I think that you're going to um, do great things, and you just have to make sure that you're doing the things that you're proud of without feeling like you have to mine your trauma just to get a byline or mine your trauma oh. just to get a following. You know, I think that one of the most important things that I've ever been told, again, by Roxanne Gay, I love her so much, is that don't lose yourself in the face of, you know, the idea of, like, popularity and don't forget who you are when you're, you know, at a place where people are listening to you and you're at a place where um, people are asking you for things. It's like, know your worth hold the line and know your worth and it was just me really first of all knowing that I deserve to be paid more than I was being paid Mm. for my articles and stuff but also just understanding that I don't have to give everything to everyone Mm -hmm. you know there are still things that I can keep for me and still be able to tell stories that matter to people Mm. because before it was like my early work was fully like a diary entry I was writing things that were like girl my life sucks everything is hard disability is exhausting blah 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 and then when I really started to look at the world more and talk about the fact that disability impacts our larger um, experiences as people in the world then it became less like oh feel sorry for me 
been more like, here's my thoughts on how accessibility negatively impacts, you know, public spaces or negatively impacts our well-being as people regardless of disability or not. You know, just being able to realize that not everything has to be about my personal experience to matter, you know. Good. And then you do get to hold some of it, you know, for yourself, which is right. which is important um, as well. And I know it's it's interesting because going from feeling like invaluable to then like expert in a certain <laughs> way is pressuring because you want to feel like you got to talk about all the things and, you know, and really just. I imagine even finding your space, knowing your space, what is what you really want to share with the world, I imagine has been a journey. So, so that's, that's great. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think for me, I used to be so concerned about being uh, pigeonholed and put in a box and only being told like, the only thing that's valuable about you is when you talk about disability, right? And I think that a lot of people and a lot of publications in many ways did tell me that. But the moment that I was like, nope, I'm going to write about grief and Paramore and <laughs> Demi Lovato and all these things that matter to me in The Pretty One that I was like, oh, no, I can do this outside of The Pretty One, too. So for me, it's like I'll hook and sneak you in with some disability stuff for sure. But I am going to absolutely slide in some other things that matter to me in the process and just realizing that, like, I have other things to say that don't have anything to do with disability. And so it's like making disability not the actual subject, but even the lens through which I see myself and the work and not making it the sole thing that's about me because people are going to do it on their own. I don't have to give them, you know, ammo to do it from my own stuff. <laughs> that's, and, and then it helps to, I think, I don't know if you ever feel this way, but, you know, in many ways, the community can feel small because we hit, tend to hear from, you know, certain voices consistently. And then, you know, whether that breeds a feeling of competition and, and all of that. And so I think that it really allows when you really embrace who you are, then it allows you to it's it's the uniqueness of who you are. So you don't have to worry about, you know, we can all rise together, you know what right. I mean? Because you know that the the um the whole of your experience is is really what what matters and and your lens and your perspective is not going to be the same as mine and you and I'm reading your thing like oh my gosh I resonate so much with you and yet I know that there are differences in our experience that make us both valuable you can have five black disabled women in one space and still it's gonna be okay like you don't exactly Right. Right. Exactly. Like there's definitely room for more than one of us, please. Because I don't want to be the only one in the room anyway. Yes. That's boring. Who am I supposed to laugh with? What do you mean? Exactly. And I just feel, I feel like we're at a place now, too, where we can open doors for each other. You know, we like the further we get, we lift each other up and we make sure that there's room for this next person. And, and I think for me, it's like I feel like I'm my best self when I'm in community with you. Yes. and Melissa and just cool. even if we're just talking about nothing that matters it feels so good to know that there are people who share my experience in a way that I never had access to before but also in a way that we can cheer each other on and be like yes, yes girl I can't do this thing but you can do it and like I'm so excited for you and I'm happy to be um, able to help you do this thing or just giving each other advice like having that now as an adult almost th- I'll be 30 next month is just mm-hmm. It's a dream come true because I never thought it was going to be like that. I thought it was just going to be me figuring it out on my own forever. And then the internet happened. That's yep. the thing I'm grateful for. <laughs> it's, it has literally changed my, I mean, I, that's really, I think for me, there were a lot of things that like the evolution, you know, in terms of um, disability identity and pride and all that. But when you find the people that feel the most where your experiences like collide in so many different places, that's when you, because like you said, when you don't see yourself, you don't see yourself as, as valid or, or valuable. And so when you find that, it then does definitely fuel you for all that the world, you know, will even throw at you. So that's really great. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes. What do you, so then what, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, but, you know, for folks that are aiming to find their community because they don't have necessarily even mothers like we had. Mine was very much the same. I remember her telling me as we were leaving for college, you know, she's like, I never thought you would actually leave home. I'm like, what? <laughs> she was like, uh, I just didn't tell you that. Right. And so I'm like, oh, she was like, you would say you were leaving. I'm like, okay, you wanted to ride the bus. She's like, I never saw anybody ride the bus, but in a wheelchair, but I didn't tell you that, you know? And so yeah. similarly, um, I have that story, but, but some people don't. And yet we do have, you know, technology looks different. Social media looks different and all of that, which was different from my experience growing up. So what, what do you say to folks that don't necessarily have that built in or even what we now get to experience, um, you know, in relationship with one another in terms of community? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I guess one thing I would say is that even if it's not built in, you can find it. Um, because again, I'm the only physically disabled person in my immediate family. Um, like I, so it's always just been me, but when I found the internet, um, and when I found different books, I mean, we don't have nearly as many books as we should about disability, but I think just seeing bits and pieces of myself in characters that were either Black um, women or like queer, it really allowed me to be like, oh, I can create that community that I'm so desperate to have. Mm -hmm. And it is a lot to do with being online and being able to talk to people who live in different states because I would have never had this otherwise. We would have never met nope. without the internet. So Don't I think- a person. It's so funny, right? You're like, right. oh, my girl. <laughs> have I ever, like, oh no, we never actually met a person. <laughs> yeah, right, right. There's so many people for me that are like that. And it's like, oh, I really care about this person, but no, we haven't met yet. I always say yet. Yeah. And I think that, um, the internet is a great way to do that, but I think it's harder if you don't have access to the internet. And so I, I would honestly say, if you have access to a library, even, mm -hmm. um, there are ways to find yourself in books, but also make sure that you remember that you can also tell the stories that you want to tell. You can also be your own representation. Like I tell people all the time, I'm like, I have never seen a Black disabled woman on TV or in movies that made me feel like I was seen. So I'm going to be that for me. I'm going to... I'm girl. I, I want to be in movies and in TV shows and, and be that representation that I think we don't even have yet. Yep. Um, so I would say if you don't have access to the internet, books, there are ways to find um, representation in books and stuff. But also, if you do have access to the internet, go on social media, you know, Twitter, it's a mess, but it is. It helps you find people so well, and Instagram, and even Facebook. Right? But yep. you know, it's a, it's they're they're really great tools to find people, and and I think as long as you're being honest about who you are and talking about things that matter to you, like I kid you not, one of my friends, one of my oldest friends on the internet, I met because we watched Glee. We watched Glee. We loved Glee. Glee was everything to us. And so, wow. so you you literally find people who like that weird thing that you think nobody else likes you'll find a whole community of people who actually like that thing so it's not even like you have to initially open up and be like yeah i want to talk about how it feels to be dis disabled or like mm -hmm. or you know i don't think i know anybody in the world who is disabled and also mm -hmm. likes law and order as for you but let me tell you there are so many people who are disabled and also like Law and Order SVU. So that weird. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's like those those things, that weird, small um, excitement you have for some far off TV show or movie or whatever. Somebody somewhere also loves that thing that you love. Mm -hmm. And it really is about putting yourself out there and not being afraid of rejection because that's going to happen too. But there are also going to be so many people who like the thing you like and also decide that they like you yeah. in part because of it. So just try your best to remember that you miss all the shots you don't take, which is so cheesy. And also that there's somebody somewhere waiting to be the friend or the more that you've uh, 
been waiting for yourself. I love it. I love it. Oh, this is so good. I just, I have a couple more things. One is, okay, so we talked a lot about your specific piece, but, you know, the whole, and even from the introduction, the the floor, all of that, I'm just like, this is so good. So um, thinking about, you know, there's conversations around sexuality and gender identity and expression, sexual trauma, motherhood, faith, you know, you can't have a book without talking about the Black church. Um, <laughs> you can't have a Black book without talking about the Black church. Um, what, um, was, were there any other stories or a story in particular that you felt connected to? Oh yeah, I mean, there were so many. Um, Kissy Women's uh, essay. <laughs> I, I adore that also lovey um her lovey. essay was lovey. Yeah. yes yes the what's in a name i obsessed with it um my friend jessica who we met we met like i'd say right after the the list was announced we started following each other her essay is amazing there's i think that the good thing about this anthology is that there is something for everyone even if you don't like my essay, which wild, I don't know why you wouldn't. Yeah, come on, but, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you don't like mine, there are there's something for everyone. There is like I even I was starting to learn things about blackness and about living in the world that I had no idea about beforehand. You know, just reading about motherhood, which I'm not personally interested in, but I fully support it. And yes. and you know about sexuality and, and even like. Um, there's not saying there that in part about sex work, which is really interesting. And I think that like the cool thing is, is this anthology gives black people the chance to really sit in their own experiences and also learn about each other's. You know, we're not a monolith. We've been saying that for how many years now? Exactly. And this is really just, I think, the start of a conversation, you know. Hopefully there's more books in the future with other black people or other people in the fear experience or just women or you know um more disabled people i would have loved to uh, i would love to see one where there's more um disabled people and just knowing that we get to be a part of the start of something the start of a conversation just to know that i was able to be a part of that is far none a dream come true yeah it's an amazing group i was like oh my goodness oh my goodness Oh, like your question. <laughs> just looking at the names, like this is so just good. Heavy yeah. And I'm like, I'm here too. <laughs> Learning so, so much. Mm-hmm. Learning so much. So one um, of my, actually, I think this in 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 um, your essay, my favorite, the one that I I underlined a lot. There was the one that I put like the big star by. Um, he's say to be vulnerable and emotional as a black woman is to live in power which i take back every day not apologizing for who i am or the space i take up in the world and yet and this is one thing i was thinking about you also talk about still figuring out what it means to be fully you Mm -hmm. and so how does that live together i mean honestly it's just really because i allow myself to make mistakes Mm. I show up and I make mistakes and I get things wrong, but I also get them right. It's like, I'm trying to figure out still who I am fully, but I know enough about myself to know that there's no more quelling who I am. There's no more tampering down the things that matter to me. And, you know, there's no more keeping quiet and not saying anything and waiting my turn because I've done all that already. And so, even though I'm still figuring out who I am and what I want to do and who I want to be, I'm also going to show up and make my presence known and not apologize for existing in the world, not apologizing for needing um, accommodations, not apologizing for the fact that I feel things and I have opinions and I want things and I'm very open about that. Like I'm, I'm very much a person who's like, oh, I'm gonna speak this into existence. I'm gonna talk to you about how I'm like feeling sad. I'm gonna talk to you about how excited I am about X, Y, and Z things. So it's like, even though I'm figuring it out along the way, I'm also so certain that I'm not going to apologize anymore for space I take up and I'm not going to apologize anymore for just being 
I get to be no matter what. Even if I'm figuring it out all the way through, I get to be. I get to be no matter what. Come on. I want to like church fan or something. Ah. <laughs> and so that, I mean, and it's your last sentence and it's my last kind of what I'd love. It, it really, I feel like just continues this, what you just said, but you say, I'm going to continue to show up for my people. And then essentially, most importantly for myself, and I'm going to look cute doing it. Yeah. Because it's what <laughs> you deserve. And yeah, what, I guess, if you're going to get, so first of all, think about yourself. Why do you deserve it? And then, you know, and the whole of it, because you know, I'm with you on the and looking cute doing it. Yeah, the right. So we do. So yeah, like what is, in terms of, for you, but also your hope for the reader that like sees that last sentence. What is your desire there? I mean, my hope is that the people reading it decide to rise up and do the same, decide to rise up and start their own journeys towards self-love, decide to rise up and not apologize for the space that they take and not apologize for who they are, no matter who that person may be. I think for me, it's just, honestly a reminder um, that I do want to make sure that I'm being as honest um, with myself as possible and making sure that I'm putting myself first because for a very long time I was always like oh no I'm just gonna wait my turn and and hopefully things will work out and I'm just not gonna say anything because it's not important and I used to very much um, bemoan and demean my own thoughts and feelings and that really is a reminder not to do that it's a reminder for me to be like oh no, I'm going to show up and say these things and feel these things and state my opinion because I deserve to, because I've earned every single thing I have and every single thing that I will have, I will also earn. There's no need for me to be like, oh no, somebody just gave this to me out of luck. And and if that's the case, if they gave it to me because they felt bad for me, I'm going to show them regardless that I deserve what they gave me anyway. Like I'm not going to be the person who... um, willfully let life slip me by again and that's really what what it was for me and then also I just hope that people do the same that they allow themselves the room to just be and not apologize for who that person is but but being willing to grow with that person as well that's exactly I mean essentially that's what I love is I I mean it's it's the journey it's the transparency it's the just being and giving yourself permission to, like you said, make mistakes and to grow and screw up in the morning and get it back together, by the, you know, and all of the and right. Stuff, right. So, oh my goodness, I love this so much. I am so grateful for you taking time to chat um, today. Is there anything else that you would want to to offer in this space? Oh. Um... One, that I'm proud of whoever is watching this. I think this is a great first step. Keep watching them. I'm going to. Um, also, um, if you haven't, please buy my comic book story that I wrote for DC. It's, a yes. yes. it's called Who Hired the Kid? It's issue number 13. Um, I'll send you the link to that. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll make sure to put it put it up. Yeah. And so, yeah, buy that, please. And if you haven't bought my book, The Pretty One, please buy that. And then also, you can look for my children's book that's out next year. And I'm currently working on book number three. So, I've got some things in the works. Please make sure you support me. And if you like my work, please share it with people. And um, just know that there there's more coming from me, but also that there could be more coming from you. So, fully know that if somebody hasn't told you yet, I believe in you. And I'm excited for every story you're ready and willing to tell. Oh, 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 this is so good. Yes, you have all. uh, So follow Kia if you are (laughs) on all of the socials, Twitter, Instagram, amazing things already being done. And I can't wait to see you represent us on the screen. So I am so excited. Thank you. Thank you. I am grateful. First of all, grateful for who you, who you are and, um, and with that, what you do. So 
Thank you, dear. Thank you, girl. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs> bye. To stay up to date on all things Brooks and Daddies and to sign up for our live book discussion on September 12th, visit AndreaLevant.com or follow me on all the socials at Andrea Levant. And don't forget to follow Kia on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Kia underscore Maria. Can't wait to see you next time.